I sign the back of their checks week to week, so they better watch their <laughs> Today's episode of Distance Training is home to one of the greatest lacrosse players of all time who broke off and started his own league in the PLL. How does the mix go between best player and owning the league? We'll find out. And as we go into an NFL draft unlike any other, Julian Aquara coming back from injury and entering this process, how is he communicating with the teams? How is it all working from the inside? We will start right there. <laughs> All right, so we got we have Julian Arquara on the program now. So I've known your brother Romeo forever. Now I finally get to know Julian. Uh, <laughs> so how are you going about training for the draft, coming back from the injury, and quarantining simultaneously? I mean, how is that humanly possible? Yeah, I mean, it's a unique situation. Um, so uh, recently I was training in Excel, at Excel in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so I've been there um, since I actually left like maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, found out everything was kind of getting shut, da- shut down. So I drove up to Nevada, um, kind of trained with the, one of the Bishop Gorman head coach. He's got like speed trainer. So I'm still trying to get some work in because I still plan, uh, plan to get a four year record and stuff. So, um, that's kind of my plan right now. So I was trying to get some rehab done where I knew, uh, I had resources to be able to do that and then ended up leaving there. So I'm in South Bend right now, actually, and then found a local gym that's uh, open right now. So. I just go there, get a little work in, come back. Um, I use the rugby fields on campus, kind of just stay in shape and run, do some drills out there. Um, but yeah, the rehab situa- uh, situation has been going good. Um, I definitely was very grateful to be able to go to Exos for the past three months. I was there two and a half months, I would say. Um, so get the majority of the um, injury kind of rehab, um, legs swollen, get all that uh, down and get the strength back. So uh, I would say I'm on track right now. Um, I think I'm about five, five months post-op, so um, it's getting towards the uh, time that it should be kind of really healed and get everything back to back rolling. So, so what other guys were you training with there at Exodus <coughs> in Arizona? Yeah, I was uh, training with uh, Javon Kinlaw, um, Jonathan Taylor. Um, wow, there's a, there was a lot of people. Um, Sean Bradley, uh, me, um, Josh Metalis, Josh Uche. Um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of guys down there. It was a great group, so it was, it was fun to train with those guys, and they, they all had their – their days to leave and their pro days so they're all head out and I was kind of like the last one to leave so. so so when you hang with guys that are that play different cities different programs and then all of a sudden you're all working out in the same building what yeah. strikes you is it the similarities the differences do you still keep uh-huh. in contact like what's it yeah, like yeah no we still we still have our group, our group message uh, we talk a little bit in there I mean there's a lot of similarities it's kind of like a football locker room all in one again so I mean it's kind of like you leave high school go to college you saw people coming from different areas and different situation so you get to meet those guys and kind of get to know them and then um throughout the training process you got you all the same goals so you're still competing and doing all that stuff and uh i mean we have the same goal so we work out and do all that stuff and compete and kind of get to know each other go out dinner or something like that so we definitely have to have some time to get to know each other so it's a cool situation and it's pretty fun so we all enjoyed it so julian you're, you're working your way back from this leg injury right now where are you how's everything going uh, I would say about 95% right now. I definitely plan to be good by training camp and all that stuff and by the season. So I, I would definitely say about 95. There's still some stuff I need to work on and get stronger. Um, but I would, I would say everything's good. Everything looks great. I've gotten MRIs, CT scans, um, x-rays, and everything looks great. I think all the teams have that. So definitely still want to show stuff. So I think I'll be good by training camp. I'm able to do all the running, do some stuff to kind of get some movement in there and do all our body, lower body stuff. But I mean, I still want to. I mean, it's not 100% yet, so I definitely still need, got some time uh, to kind of rehab it. And hopefully once it slows down a little bit, we'll be able to get back on that. So, so once you get back to South Bend, what do they tell you about being able to use the Notre Dame facilities? What do you hear when right. you get back? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here right now. So, like, I was, I've been here for the past, like, week and a half a little bit. So, I, it's, everything's actually closed. So I've been running at the rugby fields, like I said, and then I found, like, a local gym that's been open. So, they kind of let me in and, like, two other guys who train. Um, for the whole pro day thing. Um, so they'll let us three in there, um, make sure everything's sanitized. Um, they have like a kind of indoor little track where you run out, run out, get some starts and stuff and kind of stay in shape and do all that stuff. So um, I was able to find that and I just been working out there ever since. So everything's shut down. All the coaches are somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm just kind of trying to do the most I can to stay in shape and stay ready for the season. So how about with the NFL teams? How are they still communicating with you? Because the interview process is a big part of this. I mean, they right. want to know who they're, who they're picking as a personality. And how, right. how are yeah. they still able to conduct all those interviews? And, and, and what's the process there? Yeah, I've actually uh, been having some FaceTime calls I've been doing for the past couple of days. I have like two or three more to, later to do after this. Um, I can meet with the Titans at like 2.30. So I have a FaceTime call for about 30 minutes with them. 
Um, some other teams kind of just call, reach out, and reach out to your agent. You kind of get a little, just a little, little conversation in. So, and then um, I had one earlier, right before this, and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's a cool, it's a cool, unique situation. I know that these usually when you do thirty visits, um, and I had some plans. So, I'll, I mean, with all the traveling and stuff going on, um, it's kind of hard to do that. But I definitely, it's still a cool situation to be able to have opportunity to FaceTime them and talk to them a little bit, kind of get their get a feel of what they're trying to, what their plans are, and um, where they see me fitting at. So it's, I mean, it's still fun to kind of talk to them and just get to know, get to know them a little bit. Well, what kind of a conversation are we talking about here? I mean, they have you on a whiteboard. I mean, are you, <laughs> no, are you no, talking no, X's yeah, and O's? I mean, yeah, what do they want to know? It's, it's, they can't, they can't get me on the X and O's right now. But um, I mean, it's, it's, it's still nice to kind of be able to talk to them and get to know them a little bit. They just got asked like background information, how I got to where I am right now. Um, just kind of where they see me at, where where are they, where I see myself at playing. Really, um, it's really more get to know you kind of thing. Um, pretty casual conversation, so it's not too bad. And hope, hope, I mean, maybe I don't know. I still got some ahead of me, so maybe they might try to get me on the whiteboard. I don't know how, but I don't really got kind of wall space in the back to kind of do all that stuff. <laughs> and what what's the one drill? Let's, let's say a totally one hundred percent healthy Julian Aquara. What's the one drill you know you would have killed at your pro day that you're not going to get the chance to prove? <laughs> I would have killed all of them, honestly. I was I was definitely looking forward to that. Definitely forty. Um, I know I, I'm pretty fast. Um, so I what would you have ran? Uh, I ran a four five three last spring. Ooh. So I with the, if I would have had the training, I would I would probably say four 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 five four four five um, around there. So I mean, I'm definitely kind of bummed about that, not being able to show that and kind of show who I am, how athletic I am, how strong. But I mean, I was able to do the bench press. So I was kind of satisfied with that number, but I knew everything else I'd be able to kind of blow out the water. Which I'm kind of bummed about that, but I mean, there's definitely there's still some stuff. Um, I was able to meet with 22 teams formally and do all that stuff, so it was, it was still nice kind of get to get my face in front of people and have the opportunity to be invited to the combine. So, what does it feel like your whole life? I mean, you've been going. It sure, would be a hell of a dream to go be in the NFL, go through this NFL right. draft process, and you're just so lucky that your year is the 2020 coronavirus that shuts down the <laughs> entire world. How, what can you even say <laughs> about what's I, happening right now? You really, like the you, really can't say, you really can't say much. I mean, I, I just found out yesterday our commencement got canceled too. So it's like you went to college, kind of hoping to graduate from there. And even my high school graduation, I was barely even able to attend that. I had to fly. I flew in for like, what, like 15 hours, flew straight, got off the plane, ran pretty much like sped to graduation, was there for what, an hour, two hours. Um, flew out the next day so I mean my whole graduation process between high school and college kind of messed up right now so I mean it's it's cool unique unique situation it's different um I mean definitely not the best best opportunity but I mean it could be so much worse um I mean hopefully I'll get drafted and that's something I'm looking forward to is the dream is still there and the things I'm working for are still there so I'm just looking forward to be able to be on a team and you know, to get my life going and um, kind of win a Super Bowl really so I'm looking forward to that so so I was really thinking I was thinking first round um towards the end of the year. I mean, to me, it was it was getting pretty clear that you were a first-round guy, just watching you play, watching what your brothers turned into in the NFL. And, and you know, regardless of what anybody says, they're going to compare you to your brother. And his success <laughs> is a good thing for you. you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What are you hearing now? I mean, there's just so much that's changed. Given the injury, given the everything going on in the world, what are you hearing? Uh, and how much uncertainty do you have going into this thing? I mean, yeah, I mean uh... – I try. I try not to think about it too much. I try to pay attention to it. But I mean, I, I, there's stuff about late first round, early second round, late second round, third round, whatever it is. I mean, I, I know that I'm, I'm gonna have an opportunity at the end of the day. I mean, my brother has made a an example of that he went undrafted and be able to see his path, and he's going into the fifth year of the NFL. Really, I think it's all about consistency and what you bring to the table each and every day. So I think just being having the right mindset and uh, keeping your head down, staying humble, and being the hardest worker in the room. I think that's just the mentality I, I plan to bring to the NFL. And, everything I want to do in the future. So, I mean, just staying humble. I, I don't really care what round I get. I know the team is going to pick me up. I'm going to find whatever they need to be. Um, it's just about really just keeping my head down and being the best best player I can I can be. So, t take me back to when you were a kid, Julian. Uh, in your introduction to football, first your introduction to the United States coming over, <laughs> what sports were you playing? And then how did you finally get to football? Um, so, earlier on, um, I was playing tennis. Uh, I've trained from, like, 5 30 a.m to like 5 p.m i was doing that all day like every day in the summer um so i was a huge tennis guy i played a little bit of soccer um played lacrosse in high school my ninth grade uh for one year um so i, I played a lot of sports but then eighth grade was when i um, started playing football 
I played safety. I wasn't really bit, very good. I had a pick six, but that's about the only stat I had that that year. Um, they didn't so hang on, hang on. Why? So why no football up until that point? Why was it lacrosse? I, like, is that your mom's doing? Or is that my your, parents? My your parents brother? were forcing me to play all the all the other sports, and like they were in, in eighth grade. Um, that's kind of when I just like I was like, yeah, I play football. Like seventh grade, I I really I don't know. Like I just everyone around me played football. Like my friends, uh, like my brothers, and then ended up just trying to play it in eighth grade. Um, I think we had a whole like. I don't even know. Like it just, I, eighth grade was just the year, really. Um, but I mean, that's about it. I mean, it worked out. So, I mean, a lot of guys start when they're younger. A lot of guys start play one year in high school and they get their offer and become the player they are now and stuff like that. So, I think everyone's path is different. But still, I mean, I was able to. I was fortunate to be played at played a very great high school. That had a great high school uh, head coach and he was able to put my brothers, put my brother out and at, at Notre Dame, put me out at Notre Dame, put some other guys who, who come through Audrey Kelp, Prince Jumbo, all those guys. Um, there's a lot of guys who's come come out of my high school and fortunate enough to be around surrounded by those guys and uh, who had the best interest for me. So it's been it's been good. What, what's Romeo's? What's your brother's greatest influence on your life? Uh, I, I would honestly everything. Um, I don't know. I, he's someone I, I lean on to kind of get advice from. He's been through it all. So I mean, just being able to have him and my family really as my backbone and support system. Um, ask him questions, whatever I need, um, just to see his path and the way he handle, handles his business. Um, that's how I plan my hand of mind, just staying quiet, stay in the shadow, and just doing my work, really. Um, so, I, I mean, just really staying humble. I think I come from a great family. He's raised me the right way and um, having the right mindset to dominate every, everything you, everything I do. In a different way, I lean on your brother for advice, too, so I can relate to all that. <laughs> I can for sure relate to that. He's one of the greatest photographers that I've ever been around. And when you're yeah. hanging around him, he'll just bring out his camera and he'll snipe a yeah. shot. And then Take you see it about four or five days later. And it's like one of the great keepsakes yeah. you'll have from the entire trip. <laughs> what is your love away from football? Are you a photography guy, too? Uh, what, what is your uh, I actually, I actually just bought a Leica, too. So I actually just bought one. I think Romeo's trying to steal it from me a little bit because he has, like, three different ones. And I just bought like, a different one that he doesn't have. And he, he's thinking about getting that one. So I, I definitely want to get into photography a little bit. Um, but I also bought like a DJ mixer thing, so I'm trying to get into that. I'm trying to get a little, get a little something going. Um, nothing crazy. I'm not making beats. I want to be a Coachella or nothing like that. But I definitely want to be able to kind of mix, mix music a little bit. So that's just kind of what I want to do my free time and kind of play around with it and see where that goes. How about in terms of are you hearing anybody as we go through the the weirdest combine and pro day season of all time? Are you hearing of anybody that is videotaping a pro day? And then sending it to all 32 teams or posting um, it or just I mean, some people are like some people are like kind of making YouTube videos and stuff. But I'm actually supposed to uh, record like a 40 video kind of on Thursday and show like do some drills, kind of put that out there, show teams I'm healthy and stuff. So um, I'm I'm actually getting the guy to kind of record that stuff for me. Um, he he lives in Fort Wayne, so he's got kind of like a short drive up. Um, so I definitely try to put something out there, kind of show teams and kind of put put a little put a little trust in them and know know that I'm I'm, I'm gonna be back to what I am and who I, who I was. Um, but I think there's no drop off. I just want to show that I can run and show my legs back. And that's a lot of, that's a question I've been asked all the time. Just kind of see where my legs are right now. So I just want to be able to show that and see what, see where that goes. So get, give me a quick compare and contrast between Julian and Romeo as players. What's like, <laughs> what's different? Oh, Romeo's not that fast. Like he's fast, but not as fast as me. Um, he, he's a little bigger, but I still think I'm stronger. I think I put up, I think he'd have put, he'd have put up like 21 reps at 225 when he was coming out and I put up 27. So I got a little bragging rights there. Um, I got a pick in college, got a little bragging rights. So I think I I can catch the ball. He probably can't. <laughs> um, but I know. I, I think we're definitely different players. But we bring lots of different things to the table. But um, I think I'd, I I would like I would like to say I'm better. But we'll see how I think we go on the next level. And I don't know. I'm I'm fortunate he's playing at the at the level he's at right now. I'm fortunate that I'm being able to play at the next level also. So I mean, it's a little friendly competition, but nothing nothing too crazy. Yeah. All right, we'll get, we'll get to you. This is our lockdown lightning round right here. We're going to put you through the gauntlet. Past <laughs> or present, anyone through time, who would you most want to join your quarantine crew in South Bend? Anybody? Like football anybody, or like bro. anybody? Anybody, bro. Anybody. I got, it got to be someone funny. So, like, I'd probably say, like, Dave Chappelle would be funny. I think that'd be a funny person to kind of be around. So that'd be a good one. You see the new stand up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, we won't get into that. We'll, we'll, talk, about that. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Right, so would you uh would you rather be able to freeze time or travel in time? 
Uh, I'll say travel in time. That'd be kind of, be kind of cool to go back. I would go back, probably not for him, but. What would you do? Like, I don't know. Just kind of see how it was back then a little bit, kind of messing around. I, I definitely want to experience the 80s a little bit. I know things were oh, probably kind too. of cool back then. So I feel like that'd be a cool, cool little time to go back and kind of experience a little bit. The 80s. Man, we're going along just fine. Driving, driving diners or something. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So if you weren't playing football, if football, I mean, listen, football until eighth grade was off the table. If yeah. football had never come into your life, what would you be doing right now in your mind's eye? I'd probably be playing at the U.S. Open, Wimbledon or something like that. Were you that good at tennis? I, I like to think I was pretty good. I think I just didn't go as many, like, go around for many tournaments. But if I really bought into it and started younger, like a lot, of, a lot of tennis players start when they're like, what, seven or something like that. Um, I started when I was like, maybe 12, 13. So I think if I, if, if I kind of stuck with that, I'd probably be able to make a name for myself, do something with that. Or I don't know. I, I like a lot of sports, but I'd, I'd probably say tennis. Yeah. Okay. And this, this is the final one here. It's, so what we're doing. It's the quarantine ID. This is on the internet. You've probably seen this by now. It's the, it's the last thing you ate and then your high school mascot. So I'm the over easy, the over easy bluebird. <laughs> what what should we call you? I'm the oatmeal nights. <laughs> like oatmeal a little bit. <laughs> I don't sound too, I don't sound too intimidating. <laughs> Dude, thank you for doing this, man. Join our Quara. Should thank you. should be a damn first round pick. And if you don't, you're gonna regret it. Thanks for the time. For sure gonna regret it. <laughs> thank you. It is an honor to welcome Paul Raybill, perhaps the greatest lacrosse player of all time, co-founder of the Premier Lacrosse League or the PLL. How are you adjusting to the new normal? out there in LA? Yeah, it's hard. I appreciate uh, you having me on. I, I think we're all collectively trying to adjust uh, professional athletes to any kind of worker issues. How do I stay physically fit in our case and, and mentally sharp? Um, you know, as a league, we have a, a little bit more cushion than take the NBA or the NHL that had to adjust in the middle of their season we're not scheduled to start until this summer. Uh, so our players are still in preseason training mode, myself included. But this is the time of year where you're ramping up. And I was on the field every day shooting. And now that's been stripped out of my daily routine. So I've had to adjust. So is this, is this sort of two-pronged for you? I mean, how, how are you approaching it first as an entrepreneur and then secondly as an athlete trying to stay in shape? Yeah, so the entrepreneur's side of it is more complicated and dynamic, I would say, because we, two weeks ago, announced in our LA and New York offices that all of our employees would be working remotely. So we had to make sure we had the infrastructure set up there. The good news is that you know, we launched in 2018, and our first season on NBC was this past summer in 2019. So uh, given that like maturity of, of our business, we were... Uh, we were used to working remote to a degree. So a lot of our executives just continued to, to rock and roll from home. Uh, but I think management of league initiatives all the way down to like daily social and content marketing campaigns we're pushing out is just a little bit more difficult for every company. Um, and then on the executive side, my co-founder and CEO, older brother Mike of the business, and we're, we're just having conversations daily with our network partner, with every venue that we're playing in this year, with our board, uh, with you know, public health officials from CDC to my alma mater at Johns Hopkins. Um, and we have this black ops group that's also part of our investor list that uh, you, know, you have people in healthcare, you have people uh, working on the hedge fund side of the house that uh, are modeling out different scenarios. So it's our job as entrepreneurs to make sure that first our players and our fans will be healthy and safe in an environment that we play in and then it's, okay, logistically, you know, the time to get there and, and then how we uh, roll that out. So that is, like, insanely fluid, and every league's dealing with the same thing. I was talking with Adam Silver about it uh, two weekends ago, just seeing where they're at and then where the WNBA's at, where the G League's at, and then NBA Summer League. So they have all these moving uh, pieces as well. And then as an athlete, I think, you know, when you become a professional in sport, uh, you have over time routinized what you do. And so the difference for a stick ball sport like us, it's outdoors is that we basically got stripped of those reps out on field, shooting the ball into the net. 
uh, playing against defenders and such to get into game shape. But the physical conditioning can be kept up in home. So, um, but then I have weights here and, um, and uh, you know, I'm working out probably more each day yeah. than you did when I was uh, in the normal state because you just kind of get stir crazy. And one way to calm down or even boost up energy is to like, you know, pump out a hundred quick push-ups, a couple hundred sit-ups, and then get back into it. Take me to that stir crazy though, because that's something that I can for sure relate to. I mean, yeah. what have you found? And a lot of people around the world can relate to too. What have you found to sort of break yourself out of the mental shell that this Corona can create? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is you've got to get out of bed every morning with the same kind of purpose and strategy that I do on a normal day. So that means, you know, getting out, showering, cooking breakfast, and then doing my workout. Then, uh, Probably, you know, getting ready for work, trying to dress like I'm ready for work. Um, and I think those kind of routines really help change the, the success of our day. I know from when I first graduated from Johns Hopkins back in 2008 and was a professional lacrosse player for the first time, that it's easy to just roll out of bed and, and like work from home. But at, I think that deteriorates over time. It kind of screws with your mental health. So I think there are little things that you can set up there. Um, and then secondarily is uh, taking space for yourself. The, the interesting thing is because, you know, we're working from home, we're working out at home, we eat at home is, uh, you know, a thing that we take for granted when we're at work or, or just a regular day is like an hour for lunch or a couple hours for dinner. And it's really easy to have your lunch ready, eat it, and then go back to your computer and you're not actually giving yourself space. So I found uh, trying to like really calendar my day and give myself give myself space for to like think and be creative and, and just pause for a second is important. Uh, let me ask you this: How the hell can a, a star player launch the league that he's going to play in? I mean, you you got to catch me up in that. How does that work? Yeah. So uh, I I modeled the, the PLL off of Jackie Moon. And what we saw uh, <laughs> yeah. being able to accomplish. Uh, now, I think I think for our sport, we saw the opportunity over the last decade really ensue with new media, social media, and technology, and the ability for non-big three sports to reach an audience and grow. So the game was taking care of itself. We have two and a half million participants in the U.S., ten million fans. We got provisional recognition for the Olympics. It's looking like we'll be an Olympic sport in LA in 2028. So you have all this macro level growth, but if you look at the big three, for example, they were always more successful at the college and youth level before they unlocked pro, and it never happens on its own. The NFL was the era of television. Major League Baseball was the first kind of linear sport that took over a market, dominated radio and print. Um, and I think the NBA has done a great job in you know, kind of tail end of David Stern's era, kind of modern era of being kind of the sport of culture and the sport that's really leveraged social media. And then you have other sports that have taken advantage of that opportunity. We felt like lacrosse hadn't done that yet. And there were ways that we could recreate a model, in particular a team sports league, in you know the, the modern day 21st century where most sports leagues in the team sport side of the house at least uh model off of you know a traditional home and away city-based model so that was the first thing and then i i would say that having a lot of help is critical so my brother as i had mentioned he's the ceo of the business and he's a serial entrepreneur so he was able to like build the business fundamentals and i was able to get a little bit more room to be creative and think about what our sport needed and what our players needed. And then we had to have great investors. So we brought on some of the best investors in sports from Joe Tai, who's the owner of the Nets and co-founder of Alibaba to groups like CAA and churning group and uh, rain group. And so these are, these are uh, investment shops that have participated in every major sport in the world. So to get that extra perspective and support, was uh, was critical, and then additionally, um, I think just being really regimented. Obviously, I care a lot about sports business and sports media, and I think a lot of athletes do, and that's why you see athletes grow across social because it's 
it's really uh, fulfilling to share your story. And that's essentially what sports are. It's, it's a, you know, it's an avenue to, to tell a really compelling story around a game that's played with, you know, high integrity and high competition. People wait on the edge of their seats to see the results. And, um, you know, luckily we get to try and do that, you know, on a, on a day-to-day basis. So, Paul, what, what league do you look at and you go, that's it. That's what I want the PLL to look like. What up, rising, growing, maybe it's already there. What model do you see that wins? Man, that's a great question. So I love what the NBA does in way of, you know, wrapping around, you know, their, their biggest athletes, their biggest celebrities. And um, their athletes do a great job of hooking into the city-based culture and the teams that they play for in those markets. But we've seen over the last decade free agency take on a completely new shape. I mean, LeBron James is, is arguably going to be the first NBA player to have played on three different teams and won and starred for those three different teams and won three different championships by choice, taking that opt out, not being traded, um, and continuing to grow his, his following and his audience. That was inconceivable in the Jordan Bird magic era, right? And uh, I think that they've done a great job of, of balancing that threshold. I think that there are sports like the UFC that uh, it was probably the prime example of a league that was built around a discipline that existed like lacrosse for hundreds of years in MMA. And Dana White and the Fertitta brothers are basically like, let's professionalize this thing by focusing on our athletes. We'll buy some commercial inventory and launch Ultimate Fighter as a reality show. We'll drive up a bunch of hype and promotion and focus on our athletes and rely on them to do their job in the octagon. And that's kind of how we think about it is how much promotion and hype and how much can we galvanize an already existing lacrosse audience? How can we bring in new sports fans and then allow the players to take care of what they do on the field? And uh, so I, I think it's a good balance of what we see great team sports leagues doing now. Uh, the NFL, I think, is, is unique. It's very hereditary. It sits on its own. I, I, I actually think it a bit more as an anomaly to modern sports than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I look at UFC, I even look at something like the WWE as, as a fascinating case study, obviously a, a scripted sport that we know, um, and they, and they care to share and, and they know it too. But the idea that you can kind of dramatize something that's, that's happening and, uh, and hook in such a large audience that's global, um, around competition and personalities is something that I'm always like kind of looking at. It's the way people are telling stories. So, so do people still talk shit to the league owner? How's that work? Yeah. yeah do they? they? On the field? Yeah. <laughs> no yeah. way. And I, and I resist and I resist talking back, you know. Get out of here. No, you don't. I always tell them that I sign the back of their checks week to week, so they better watch their fucking <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I actually finally got one out of you. Their checks, but anyway. <laughs> so we finally get to use the beep. All right, let's get to our lockdown lightning round here. I, I will say, though, I will say to that point, um, some guys have taken jabs at me at the field. But what's unique about our league is not only did we uh, launch by paying our guys four times greater wage than what we used to get paid in Major League Lacrosse, which was the existing league at the time, but we also – gave our guys access to healthcare, which has been huge during this time because COVID testing is included in that. And most of our guys have taken the company healthcare, which is year round. And then the third piece is we offer our players stock options. So they get paid in stock options in addition to their wages in healthcare oh, wow. for games played. And so theoretically, every player that's suited up in a PLL game, or technically I should say, is also an owner. Um, so I could always respond to them and say, well, why don't you act like an owner? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I got to say like the access portion of the league too is insane. I was looking on YouTube and some of the stuff, like the clip, it's, it's a little XFL like where it's yeah. just anything goes, any mic, any time, anything goes. All right, let's get to our lockdown lightning round here uh, before I get fired my first week on the job. Past <laughs> or present, anyone through time, who would you most want to join your quarantine crew? Wow. Um, Probably Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> nice. Uh, you're fired. All right, number two. Uh, what are you binge watching right now? 
Uh, Ozark. Ozark. I considered going back to Game of Thrones just because it's so good and this feels like pretty bleak times. So yeah. it's like, yeah, I've got been like playing uh, Roman Jawadi, I think is uh, the, uh, the producer of all the orchestra in Game of Thrones. I actually listen to that playlist when I work out. That's how twisted I am. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the interweb I've been reading says that the quarantine ID, it's the last thing you ate plus your high school mascot. So this is Oatmeal Bluebird. What may we call you? Impossible Stags. You ate Impossible? Impossible Meat. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm vegan, man. you're vegan. I mean, I literally just had lunch, and I was eating an Impossible Burger. <laughs> this is unbelievable. There we are. Paul, thank you, bro. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. So on this episode, we have one guy fighting to get into the league and another guy who's at the top of the game who's broke off and now building his own league, and both of them really just trying to figure out and navigate this new world just like the rest of us. For more from Distance Training, head over to NBCSports.com, the NBC Sports YouTube channel, and all the social channels as well. See you next time.